as we study about the Holy Spirit of God. And this month we're talking about the Holy Spirit of God in, in our worship, in the things that we do when, when we assemble together, especially upon the first day of the week, just like we're doing right now. And what a beautiful song, what an appropriate song to sing in talking about uh, giving praise to God. Uh, and uh, especially that second verse, laws which never shall be broken. The truth is God's Word accomplishes everything God intended it to accomplish. Now if we go to Matt, that doesn't mean that people cannot break the law of God. But there are consequences whenever you do. In Matthew chapter 21, in verse 44, Jesus, in talking about himself as the rock, he says, everyone that throws himself upon this rock will be broken. Now that's a fact. That's true. Because we're not the rock. All we are is clay pots. We're just clay pots. We're not even expensive china. We're just clay pots. Now there's significance to the, those clay pots. And, and we'll spend time in the future talking about that. But God has, has put his, entrusted His Word in, in earthen vessels. That's us. And you, and you take a clay pot and you, and you throw it on a, on a boulder, on, on a giant rock, and, and it's going to break. And God is calling us to do that with ourselves. Break ourselves. And he goes on to say in the very same breath, but whoever the rock falls upon, he's talking about judgment, will be crushed into powder. Now it's not a question of whether we're going to be broken. We're going to be broken. We're going to be broken. The question is, will we break ourselves? Will we yield ourselves to the truth of God's Word and accept what He has said and break ourselves in doing that? Or will we wait and be defiant and wait until the rock falls upon us and crushes us into powder? Now that wouldn't be a good thing. So begin with me, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26. Listen to what God is saying here. He says, what is the outcome then? What is the outcome? Brethren, I love that word. I love the language of the Scripture. We are brothers. We're part of a family. And we've, we've referred to that so many times in our studying of, of the Holy Spirit, especially as we were looking at the miraculous gifts that were given in, in chapter 12, where, where God says, now we are... Christ's body. And he's referring to us here as brethren. He says, what, what then is the outcome, brethren? Listen to what he says. When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. For edification, for building up. Never for tearing down. Never for dividing. Never for hurting. Only for building up. This is powerful. This is so important. Build up. Put that down. Write it down. Write it in your Bible. Underline that word edification. And, and in case you might forget, write build up there close to it somewhere so that you see it. Build up. This is what God wants of us when we assemble ourselves together. Let everything be done for building up. And then back to the verse that we looked at last week as we began our studies when we were talking about prayer. Listen to what he says in verse 15. Let's remind ourselves again. What is the outcome then? I love the way he begins these two verses. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the mind also. I shall sing with the Spirit. I shall sing with the mind also. I will sing with, with my Spirit from deep within me. I'm going to sing from the very bottom of my heart, from the bottom of my soul, and I'm going to sing in an understandable way. Not only to, to myself, but also to others. The only way you're able to build someone up is if they understand you. If they understand you. Now there might be moments where you can look at someone and they look at you, and, and, and just in looking at each other, you, you're able to, to encourage. And, and I, I look out, I love being up here on Sunday morning. I wish it. No, all of you stay where you are. But I wish everyone could be up here and look out and see everyone. See the beautiful faces. 
See the encouragement. And there's so, so many of you, maybe you don't even realize how much of the Scripture you know. But when I read the Scripture, when I quote the Scripture so often, I see your lips moving. I mean, your lips are moving with the words. And, and maybe some of you don't even realize that, that you're actually doing it. You've read the Word of God so often, and, and, you've, and, and you've heard it so often, that whenever you hear it again, it's just right there, and you're there with it. And it's not that you're reading the screen behind me, because your eyes aren't on the screen. I see your eyes in my eyes. And, 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 it's, and it's wonderful. In the building up, the encouragement that, that you give. And, and, and some of you are, are, are down there and you're, you're saying, go get them. Go get them. And probably some of the rest of you are saying, well, tell them not to say that so often. But God is telling us when, when, we, when we worship Him, when we pray, we pray in an understandable way and we pray from the very depth of our heart, depth, the depths of our soul, the depths of our spirit. And, and this is a, a personal thing that is shared with the assembly. It's my spirit. It's my understanding. It's my spirit and my heart that's talking. And it's yours also. And together, collectively, we offer that up to God. But it's something that we all understand. And last week, we talked about how important it was to understand. Because if you don't understand when someone's leading a prayer, how can you say amen? And God uses that reasoning. And this morning as we study about singing, there's two, ver two, two Bible verses we're going to look at. Two different passages. And, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. In fact, all of our time this morning. And the first one is, and these two are, are, are very important when it comes to singing. They're, they're two of the anchor verses. And the first one is in Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to begin in verse 15. I want you to listen to what God says. And then we're going to see the sister passage over in, 1 Corinthians, or in Colossians uh, chapter 3. So listen first, out of Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15, he says, Therefore be careful how you walk. Be careful how you walk. I mean, we're living life. Be careful how you walk. Not just that you walk, but be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let me tell you, church, the will of the Lord can be understood. Now, the Scripture hasn't stopped and we're coming back. But the, the will of the Lord can be understood. I mean, there's not a commandment that God has ever given that we cannot understand and that we could not obey. Now, every commandment God has given obviously has not been given to us. But every commandment God has ever given is just as simple as the first ones He gave Adam and Eve in the garden when He said your responsibility is to dress and keep the garden. Now, He didn't have to go into detail. There are some obvious things that, that need to be done if, if you're going to take care of a garden. And He says of every tree you can eat freely. They understood that. They didn't have a problem with that. But He said of one tree you're not to eat. The tree that is in the very middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're not to eat of that tree. Not only does He tell them what it is, but He tells them where it is. He says, don't eat of that tree, because the day that you eat of that tree, you'll surely die. Now they understood that. In fact, when Satan questioned them, Eve responded by saying, God said, that, in fact, she, whether God went on and explained more to Adam and Eve, we don't know. But Eve supplemented the, the comments that God had made, she said, God said not even to touch it. Not only did God say not to eat it, but, but we're, not even, we're not even to touch We're not even to get this close to it. What are you doing there then? What are you doing there? Close enough to reach out and get it. If God said not to be there. Well, see, they understood. They, they answer correctly, but sometimes we don't want to believe what God says. That's really where it is. Sometimes we don't want to believe what God says. It's not that God has trouble communicating with us. He created us. He made our minds. He understands our thoughts, even from afar off. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. What does dissipation mean? It simply means excess. It simply means going too far with something. 
He said, do not be filled with wine because that's going to lead some, some people, our translators will put debauchery here, which is sinfulness. And, and, first the, and, and, and the first thing that, that happens whenever you start drinking is you start losing your ability to, to control yourself. I don't watch the, the show Cops. In fact, we don't even have television stations at our house. We have a television and, and a VCR player. Maybe we shouldn't even have that because, you know, those are so controlling. But I, I, can, I can remember times watching the movie Cops or whatever it, it is that, that you might watch. And, and you see the person that's been pulled over for, for DUI and they're trying to convince the policeman that they're not intoxicated. I mean, you, you begin, you've, you've gone already, you've gone over the line. You've, you've already had too much. God says, stay away, don't be drunk with wine. Because that's only the beginning. It's not just the getting drunk with wine, it's all that happens. It's all that happens because it then controls you. Well, that's a good analogy that God gives us here. Now He turns around and He says, Do not be drunk with wine where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Wine will control you when you're drunk. You don't say, well, I'm drunk, I've had enough. You just keep drinking more and more and more. And it can let the Spirit control you. I mean, that's as, as simple to understand as black and white. And then what does he go on to talk about the very next breath? He says, do not get drunk with wine, worry, uh, for that is dissipation, it's, it, it's foolishness, it's excess, and, and, and it leads to riot, and it, and it leads to wrong. Not right, R-I-G-H-T, riot, as in rioting. As in losing all sense of right and wrong. And that's only the beginning. He says, do not be drunk with wine, we're in his excess, or, or, or dissipation, but instead... Be filled with the Spirit. And listen to what he says. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus to God, even the Father. It's powerful. Now listen to the sister passage. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 15 here also. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. He says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. Now this must be the case, if what happens next is going to happen. You see, God doesn't just speak words. He's, he always is reasoning with us. And, and if we want to be pleasing to God, if we want to be able to say, we're doing all things in the name of the Lord. See, that's important. That's, he's already said that over in Ephesians chapter 5. He's going to say it again here in Colossians chapter 3. But this is, this is paramount, church. Put this up at the top whenever we're studying. Let the Word of Christ dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. You see, if the Word of Christ doesn't dwell in us, then how are we going to know if what we're doing is in the name of the Lord? That's what in the name of the Lord means, by the authority of the Lord. I mean, if someone comes to your house late in the middle of the night, and they say, by the authority of Mike, open the door, you're going to say, Mike who? Well, by the authority of Mike Cheryl, open the door. They said, well, I know Mike Cheryl, but why would he be wanting me to open the door? See, Mike doesn't have any authority at my house. Oh, I should not have said that, should I? That came out wrong, didn't it? Oh, yes, he does have a lot of authority at his house. Judy also has authority. You know, when we teach the marriage class, we teach couples, we say, now the man is the head of the house. But the wife is the neck, and the neck turns the head. You see how that works? But if someone comes to your house in the middle of the night, and they say, in the name of Mike Cheryl, open the door, you'll say, well, I know Mike Cheryl, but why would he be wanting me to open the door? That's not going to be enough for you. 
Whatever we do in word or deed, God tells us to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. When we assemble together, that is paramount. And the only way that can happen is if the Word of Christ dwells in us richly in all wisdom. The Word of Christ dwelling in us. So we need to be asking so many times, and maybe we don't ask enough, what does Jesus want me to do here? Well, often Jesus will tell us what He wants us to do. Now there are times that God speaks that He doesn't tell us how He wants something done. He'll just tell us what He wants done. As in James chapter 1, when God tells the church, and He defines pure religion. I love that. In verse 27, of, of James chapter 1, God says, pure religion, pure, that's a worship word, you know that? That word religion there, if we go back and we start studying words. He says, pure religion and undefiled, you don't add anything to it, it's just simply pure. Now he says that twice, that should get my attention. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, is what? Well he tells me, he says, take care or visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction, and keep yourself unspotted from the world. And He doesn't tell me how to take care of widows. He doesn't tell me how to take care of orphans. But He says, if you want to be pleasing with your Father, those are two things that you ought to be looking at. Church, we ought to be looking at those. We need to be looking at those. And we need to be looking at those because God looks at those. And God says, that's the very heart that's the very heart of God being expressed there. And we could have a whole series of lessons, and maybe we should, and no, no question about maybe, and, and about what does God, how does God see the orphan and the widow. He tells us all through the Scripture, one thing you don't want to do, mark it down, one thing you don't want to do. You didn't know you were getting two lessons for the price of one today. One thing you don't want to do is you don't want to do something to hurt an orphan or a widow. Because they have God's Undivided attention. Boy, we need, we need to give more thought to that. But he tells us, you take care of them, but he doesn't tell you how. You see that? He doesn't say how. He just says, see that they're taken care of. And see that you keep yourself unspotted from the world. So there's a great example of God saying, this needs to be done, but not telling you exactly how you go about doing it. And so, if you choose to do one thing in taking care of them, I choose to do something else, then we're really not at odds with each other because God doesn't say, this is how you do it. So He says for me to do all things in the name of the Lord. Whenever the Lord tells me how to do something, then that, that really takes care of all of it. That's why God explains to us, and that's why really where we began eight years ago, maybe you don't realize that, that I actually think ahead, but, but most of the time I try to. The very first lesson that we had together out of, out of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24 says that the servant of the Lord does not quarrel. The servant of the Lord doesn't argue. There's no reason for us to argue about things. There's no reason for us to quarrel about things. What we need to do is just say, what does God say about it? And see, that takes care of it all. That really does. And so, if the Word of Christ is dwelling in me richly in all wisdom, and I'm doing everything according to what Jesus has said, that takes care of it. So let's look and see what God says in these verses. Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3. Number one, Number one, he says, in these verses, you're speaking. You're speaking. He's talking about verbal communication. Now, we all understand what speaking means. Some of us may speak better than others. Some of us may use perfect diction and, 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 and speak perfect... What is perfect English? Because the English speak one way, and they call my older brother pool, and I think that's what you do to a door... And, and over here, or down in Texas, they call him Paul. And they, they drag it out. And somewhere here between Texas and, and Alaska, they just say, Paul. Now, well, now, you know what I'm talking about. Speaking. And God knows what He's talking about. And everybody understands that. He begins here, and He's talking about singing. But He begins, number one, with speaking. Speaking. Number two, He talks about our spirit. 
You remember over in, in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, I will sing with the Spirit. That's talking about my Spirit, our Spirit. Remember that. I'm going to sing. I'm going to speak to you as I sing. And I'm going to speak to you and I'm going to speak to God from the very bottom of my heart. Some of you wrestle with that. And I, I understand. Some of you are more timid than others. And I, I understand. And, and I don't want to put pressure on anyone. I don't want to embarrass anyone. But, but some of you don't feel like you have a voice that, that is worth hearing. God thinks you do. God thinks you do. Because this is not just a, just a commandment that He gives to those that have pretty voices. Now there are some people that, that sing... I remember when, when I was in college, uh, going to college in Abilene after having grown up in Abilene. My mom and dad still lived there and daddy was preaching there in Abilene. And he calls me one day, I'm a freshman at Abilene Christian, and he says, son, son, I need your help today. And I said, Daddy, if I can help you, I'll do whatever I can. I said, what do you need? He says, well, at 2 o'clock this afternoon, he, he talks about this dear sister that he had known for a long time there who had passed away, and there wasn't anyone else to take care of things, and the, and the family wanted the service, the, the funeral to be conducted very, real quickly. They were all already there. And he says, well, it's, we got a two o'clock service. We don't have anyone to come and sing. He said, can you gather up some of the university students there and bring them and, and sing? And I said, well, love to, Daddy. Love to. We'll be there. See you at two o'clock. And so at two o'clock we went. Well, see my roommate, he's standing right there next to me when I'm talking to Daddy. And, and he hears, he says, what's going on? I said, Daddy needs some help. See, my roommate couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. He only knows one note. And he's, but he, he sings as God tells him to sing. He sings from the very bottom of his heart. And he sings with enthusiasm. And, and it doesn't make any difference when he's singing. He's trying to please God. And, and so we got to the funeral, and the one we're hearing the most that day was, was my roommate David. And, and my daddy's kind of looking out of the corner of his eye, like, who did you bring to do this singing today? But it, it, didn't, it didn't sound real pretty to our ears. And so I, I reached down beside myself as I'm sitting there, and I do my hand kind of like this for the others that are there, four or five others. I want them to sing, say, like, sing a little louder. You know, maybe we can drown this guy out. And he saw me doing that. So he's singing louder. Well, I suppose everything was all right because the lady is, is buried and I think she stayed there and, and there wasn't a problem with that. She wasn't unhappy. But I understand some of you don't feel like you have a voice that needs to be heard. God doesn't feel that way. Sing. Sing. Because God has commanded us to sing. And He says, sing from the bottom of your heart, from deep within you. Sing like you do when you're driving down the road by yourself. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Even, even if you don't think your voice blends, it's okay. God doesn't say we have to blend. God doesn't say you have to follow the notes. He said, you sing with your spirit. Number three, He said, you sing with your mind or your understanding. We need to sing words that people understand. So sometimes we even need to do, and I remember Mike doing it uh, not, uh, not too long ago when, when he was uh, talking about songs. Uh, Mike Couch uh, even, even gave us some definitions to some of the words that we sing, like the song, Night with Evan Pinion, Brooded o'er the Veil, and, and uh, you may have sung that before and not had any idea what you were singing. We usually sing that right before the Lord's Supper when we sing it. And so He gave us the Word, the meaning of those words. And that's important. You need to know what you're saying when you're singing. So number one, speaking. Number two, with our spirit. Number three, with our mind. Number four is a teaching. A teaching. Same thing as speaking. It's got to be understood. It's got to be understood. Now some things we, we can understand very simply because we've, we've practiced them and we've done them before. Like, like putting on a coat. And we could, we could do that this morning. And I could let you try to tell me how to do it. And, and, but everybody knows how to put on a coat. Knows how to put on a shirt. So there's some things that come easier. Some things are easier to understand. But all things can be taught. 
And all these things that God's talking about can be understood. So whenever we praise God in singing, let's make sure that, that we're following also His instruction of teaching. Because there will be people that need to hear the teaching that's involved in the songs. Number five, one another. Oh, this is powerful. This is a big one. It involves all of us, church. Not just some of us, but all of us. And we need to sing in a way, realizing that we're, that we're involved with each other. We're speaking to one another, or we're teaching one another. Ephesians said that we speak to one another when we sing, and, of, and Colossians says we teach one another when we sing. Those two concepts are, are interchangeable there, and we need to use them together. Teaching and the one another. This is community. This is community. This is also unity. It's also unity. And maybe, maybe you don't, maybe you're not familiar with some of the songs. Maybe you like the old songs better. Or maybe some of the young people like the, the, the new songs better. But let's learn all of them because we're part of a community. This is one another. Number six. What are we teaching? What are we singing? Psalms? Psalms? And hymns? A hymn is, is, is really divided or, or defined by the very, very next phrase, spiritual songs. But they're spiritual songs. They're not country western songs. They're, they're not rock and roll songs. They're spiritual songs. And, and, they're, and they're, they're sung for a reason. And, and there's teaching that goes on. You go back and you read some of the Psalms and, 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 you, and, you, and you see this. But not just the Psalms out of the Old Testament. Some of the Psalms were, were new things within the church where they had taken some of the teachings of Jesus and, and, and put them to, to, to song. And made them into songs. And some of the teachings of the apostles and made them into songs. Just like David took the teaching in the history of Israel... And, and he wrote them into psalms, and, and, and Israel sang them. And, and, and some of them are, 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 are beautiful and, and, and move us, and we remember them, and, and others of them are challenging and express deep emotion. Do you want to see, you want to see what the, the Jewish people sang? Read the psalms. And, and all of the psalms are not pretty. Some of them are expressing our, 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 our feelings of of discomfort with God. I mean, we're having trouble in our life and we don't see the solution and, and we don't feel the calm that we would like. And, and, and people ask, where is God? Or why did God let this happen to me? God's big enough to hear that. And the truth is, He will answer. He will answer. It's not God that moves, it's us that move. Psalms and hymns and spiritual song number seven. Here it is, number seven, singing. Singing. I don't think there's a person in the United States that doesn't understand what singing means. Now whether you can do it well in your judgment or not, you know, that, that's not the question. We all understand what singing is. And that's what God says. And He says, with the heart. In the heart. From the heart. This is a heart response. This is an emotional thing. This is an emotional thing. Thank you, Scott, for your focus this morning about the Lord's Supper. That we, there's a lot involved in the Lord's Supper. Not, not only in thinking about the death of the Lord, but what did the death of Jesus do for us? It liberated us. It liberated us. We're free. There is no condemnation. There, there, there's a lot of things to be rejoicing about. There, this heartfelt emotion should come out in our singing. God expects it. With all your heart, or, or in your heart. And then number nine, to the Lord. To the Lord. Now we're, we're communicating with one another. One another is a big part of this, but in both of these chapters, or in both of these, these references, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, both of them talk about, end up talking about, to the Lord or to God. To the Lord. Remember, that's, that's where it's going. We are, we are singing in that sense to an audience 
of one. Now when we're talking about one another, speaking to one another, or teaching one another, we're talking about the whole body, and, and that is involved. But whenever we look at, at the essence of our singing and worship, our singing and worship is to God, to the Lord. That's it. That's it. That's all that God says with regard to singing. If you want to add anything else to this list, you've got to bring it in. If you want to add anything else to our singing, you've got to add it. Because God doesn't. Are you hearing that? It's, it's really, it's really that's, it. that's it. You can read these verses again. You can take them apart. You can read them. You can put them side by side. And that's it. And then God says, remember this. Remember where we started. He said, remember this, that whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do what God has commanded. This is what God has commanded. When someone asks us why we sing the way we sing, tell them that's exactly what the Lord has told us to do. That's it. There's no reason to argue about it. There's no reason to try to, to say, this is right and that's wrong and this is... A, you know, God has already said, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And if you do that, then you're able to do all things in the name of the Lord. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. That's it. Nothing else is commanded. Nothing else is commanded. Sing. Sing. Anytime. Anywhere. Under any circumstances. You can satisfy the will of God. By simply singing. That's what God says. Did you know there's not anything more important in all the world to me than that? what God says. I understand your feelings. I have some ideas myself. But God doesn't say, what do you think, Mike? What do you think, Mike? We need to be saying, what does God say? Sing. We've got a lot to work on right there. Because see, we don't all, we don't all we don't all sing from the bottom of our heart. We don't all sing from our heart. We all don't sing from the depth of our spirit. And, and, well, maybe I should have started with just the first part of that. We don't all sing. Please start. Please start. Because if you don't, you're, you're missing part of what God has told you to do. And you can't say, I'm letting the Word of Christ dwell in me and then, not, and then rebel against what He said. Sing. And then sing with all of your heart to the Lord. If you have trouble with that, it may not be trouble with what God says, it may be trouble with your heart. And if there's trouble with your heart, don't let this day pass before you make that right with God. Open up your heart and your life to Him. And if there's any way that we can help you, please let us know. Come right now while we stand and sing.